Are you ready? So many hours today. Oof. All right. Let's see what I want to tell you. So, uh, welcome back. Thank you for coming one more time these lectures. Uh, I changed a little the uh, plan for the next several lectures and the reason is that in two weeks there will be a very small conference and so I wanted to, and my lectures will be part of this conference and I wanted those lectures to be independent as much as possible of everything else. So I moved some things around. Um, I hope that in the end I will say everything <laughs> that I meant to say, only in a different order. Uh, mostly today I want to talk about uh, this funny thing, parabolic induction. Uh, two things, really. Uh, what is it? And the other thing is, why? <laughs> why is this? Uh, if you open a book in representation theory of these reductive groups, any type of representation theory of these reductive groups, you will see everywhere parabolic induction, parabolic, parabolic, parabolic. And so we would like to understand, from our point of view, why parabolic induction is so important, this funny operation. Why is it so important? And uh, just as a little bit of history, just to get started. So in this uh, set of lectures, we're dealing with unitary representations on a Hilbert space. In fact, we're dealing with Hilbert space. And this subject began uh, the way you might expect it to begin. People studied some simple examples. And for this, uh, the case of SL2 is one of the very uh, important examples. And it was studied by, most famously by Bergman but also by our friends Gelfand and Neumark, who also invented C-star algebras, by the way. And uh, what they discovered is uh, an interesting uh, dichotomy. So there are some natural examples that you can build. Because the, the group um, sl 2 naturally acts on some geometric spaces, and the most obvious thing that it acts on uh, is uh, RP1, like Mobius transformations. And uh, when you study this action, if you want to get a unitary action, you have to do something a little bit uh, clever. So I want to act by a group element on a function so as to get a new function. And the obvious thing to do is just to let the group element act on the argument in this way. I, I left some uh, space here. The reason for leaving some space is that this obvious uh, formula is not a uh, unitary representation. And the reason is that it doesn't matter how you attempt to put a measure on RP1, which is the circle, of course. It doesn't matter how you attempt to put a measure on RP1. It will not be an invariant measure for, for SL2R. So this formula, as it stands, is not going to be um, a unitary uh, measure, a, a unitary representation. But you can fix it up uh, very easily by putting in some Jacobian factor, if you like, some Radon 
derivative uh, like this. And uh, well, you're not quite done. This is uh, you're on the road to doing the right thing here. Uh, because the, the L2 norm involves a, a square, the, the right thing to do is to take the square root of this radon nicotine derivative. And now it's a unitary representation. Uh, but once you get started on this, you see you can, you can sort of play around a little bit. It would still be a, a unitary representation if you put in any complex phase uh, like this. So this is a formula that makes sense for any S. In, in the real line, and it defines not one representation, but a whole series of representations all at once. And so that's one very natural uh, family of representations. If we're talking about, of course, uh, as you know, the, when SL2R acts on the projective line by Möbius transformations, it's really an action of PSL2R because the, uh, both the identity matrix and the minus the identity matrix give the same transformation of RP1. And if you're talking about representations of PSL2R, this quotient by the two-element central subgroup, as far as continuous series of representations go, this is basically uh, it. But then there are some uh, beautiful uh, other representations. Um, by, by taking uh, the action of SL2R on the other space where it uh, naturally acts, what should we call it? Um, let's call it H maybe, the upper half plane. And uh, on, on the upper half plane, uh, there are interesting uh, geometric structures. Uh, first of all, the upper half plane is a complex manifold of the Riemann surface. Uh, and there are some interesting uh, line bundles on this surface. So we could stick in here some P some holomorphic line bundle, which is equivariant for the action of, uh, the natural action of uh, SL2R. Those turns out to be the, the integer family of those. And uh, if you just look at the L2 sections, this is a representation uh, which is far from irreducible. So if we're studying irreducible, say that, irreducible then uh, ordinary functions aren't going to make uh, the job. But if you take the holomorphic functions, then you get, you get a much smaller space. And it turns out to be, uh, well, sometimes it's zero, depending on which line bundle you take. Maybe there are no L2 holomorphic sections. That can happen. But when it's not zero, it turns out that it's always an irreducible representation. So these are the natural examples, and they came from geometry. And uh, the possible ease. parameterized by, as it happens, integers, not, not uh, real numbers. So there are discrete really re occurring representations, representations parameterized in a natural way by a discrete number, and then there are continuously occurring representations. And uh, it took a, a long time. So this is in the 1940s that this empirical discovery was made. People they did calculations and they found some examples of representations and then they wanted to conceptualize it and it took some time. Uh, the first thing that happened was that this procedure here of inventing representations was standardized. People figured out a general uh, principle for building representations of this type, not just for SL2, but for SL3 and SL4, SP2N and SOPQ, or whatever. All of these groups have similar series of representations which I'll tell you about today. Um, so the whole thing was standardized. And then eventually, um, not only was the definition standardized, which was done by Mackey, but uh, the, 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 the reason that um, these representations are so prominent, uh, this was worked out by Harish Chandran. So I want to explain these things uh, today. But here are some simple examples. When we finally end up building these representations, uh, using abstract symbols and so on. Th these are the ones we'll build in the particular case of SL2. Actually, as I s said more than once, there are two continuous families for SL2. There's a small variation on this construction involving um, uh, double cover of RP1. Great. What do I want to say? Oh, yeah, so I, I'd like to say a few bits uh, and pieces back about real reductive groups again. 
So we want to put, so, so we're focusing today on this, this first construction, uh, but we'll see something like this coming up as well. Uh, we want to put this uh, construction into some context, and for that purpose, we have to think again about uh, real reductive groups. And so for us, a real re reductive group was just a, a matrix group. It should be closed in the usual topology and finitely many components. Once it's closed, it's a Lie group, according to famous theorem of hmm, Chevalet, maybe? Cartan, I don't know. Um, but we don't want to take GLNZ. To study GLNZ, that's an entirely different uh, type of mathematics. So let's just assume there are finitely many components. And uh, the crucial condition is closed under transpose, as we mentioned before. So you can think of lots of examples. For example, all of GLNR has all of these properties. And one thing that immediately comes to mind is to intersect G with various subgroups. And, and here's the orthogonal group. This is a compact subgroup of G, and it would turn out to be a maximal compact subgroup of G. Um, but I want to uh, focus on the rest of G, the part of G which is not compact uh, for a moment, because that's what's going to be somehow more responsible for this family of representation. So let me define uh, a certain vector space of matrices. So these are, it's n by n, maybe I'll not be too deep. Let's use this standard uh, Lie algebra um, notation. In fact, we're going, the P will sit in the Lie algebra of G. Um, like that. So it's just the set of all matrices X which are symmetric with the property that the exponentials lie inside of G full. Not so good. Okay. So it's the symmetric part of the Lie algebra of uh, G. And uh, and what I want to focus on is a new, uh, attach a, a new letter to something. So what I want to, so we, uh, P is not, a, P is not a, a Lie algebra. If you take the uh, bracket, the commutator of two, um, take the commutator of two symmetric matrices, of course you get an anti-symmetric matrix, so it's certainly not a Lie algebra. But I want to look at, uh, some uh, maximal abelian subspace. Of Just choose one. There certainly are uh, maximal abelian subspaces, a vector space. Uh, it's maybe not so obvious that it's a vector space, but it follows from the theory of uh, elementary theory of uh, Lie groups that P is a vector space and. Um, Let's just choose a maximal abelian subspace. Okay. It's a family of commuting, pairwise commuting, symmetric matrices. So you can simultaneously, according to general theory, diagonalize all of them. So if you like, after changing basis inside of GLNR, you can think of these as just uh, diagonal matrices. We are, if you like, intersecting this set of, vector of, of all matrices with the diagonal matrices. Roughly speaking, that's what's happening. It can happen that when you intersect P with, with the actual diagonal matrices, you get nothing, zero. But uh, after a change of basis, then uh, the intersection of P with the diagonal matrices will be, um, oops, um, will be a maximal abelian subspace. Let's use a better letter. So we're talking about uh, things in the world of Lie algebras here. Let's call this little a instead of big A. Sorry about that. While I'm at it. When we exponentiate this thing, we'll call that fellow big A. So this is some group of uh, matrices inside of G, of course, and they're all positive definite. They all commute to one. Because when you exponentiate a symmetric matrix, you get a positive definite. Okay, and uh, we want to uh, study uh, this thing 
here a little bit. Maybe the first thing to say, to, let, me go, let me go back to P for a moment. So the, the, the basic uh, theorem is that this thing A, and therefore big A, is unique. Up to conjugacy. So if you have two maximal abelian subspaces, well, they have to have the same uh, dimension because they're actually conjugate. And indeed, they're conjugate by something uh, in K. So we'll uh, worry about uh, this in just a moment. So I want to say a few things about this because uh, we have to go slowly today, not get so tired very quickly because there's many hours ahead of us. And so we go slowly uh, at the beginning. Uh, but I also want to say some th things about... Um, matrices, and symmetric matrices, and secure joint matrices, and so on. Because uh, it, it's these very elementary things that I'm going to be telling you about which are responsible for the general shape of the representation theory. At some point, when we discuss the representation theory of these groups, we ought to use the hypotheses that we're dealing with groups of matrices that are closed under the transpose operation, finitely many components. Otherwise, there will be a problem. And so let's just see how the how the hypotheses allow us to say some interesting things here. So we're, we're, I want to say a few words about this theorem. It's just a theorem, you know, it's a fairly elementary theorem, but it's worth, worth to do it just for fun. Uh, but let me back up a little bit. I meant to say something about P. If we take uh, G to be all matrices uh, for a moment, K is, of course, all orthogonal matrices uh, in that case. And every matrix in, in GLNR can be written as an orthogonal matrix times a positive definite matrix. And in fact, this is a diffeomorphism. So that's just an exercise. You can build the map backwards. I work out the formula for the map backwards involving logarithms. And uh, so this map is uh, diffeomorphism. Now, if you have a general group of this type, uh, which is connected, then uh, this is still true. And the reason it's still true is that the map, well, I'm, I'm just taking this diffeomorphism and I'm restricting it to some smaller k and some smaller p, which is a submanifold inside of the biggest possible k and the biggest possible p. So it's still going to be a diffeomorphism onto something. And what is this something? Well, it's going to be a closed submanifold of GLNR. That's the first thing you can say. Back to closed submanifold. G and, and, and uh, the image of this map are, are manifolds of the same uh, dimension. And if you have two manifolds of the same dimension and one of them is a submanifold of the other, then it also has to be open. 
the image is not only uh, open, it's closed and geo is connected, so it's everything. I only mentioned that because we use the connectivity. Uh, there. Now for energy, uh, it's uh, still. Whether or not uh, the group is connected, as long as there are finitely many components, and this is uh, one of the few places where that, that, that finiteness assumption is, is uh, actually uh, used. And this is a sort of a repetition of the previous argument. The, the whole thing is to show that every, the, the whole difficult part of the um, story is to show that every element of G can be written in this way for some K in the K associated to G and for some X in the P associated to G. It's that surjectivity part of the argument which is the difficult part. Uh, we got surjectivity indirectly uh, in, the case of, uh, yeah, in the case of connected groups just by by this little trick that the, the image, a set of all matrices was both open and closed, so it was a component. Here you can't use that, um, but it's kind of uh, fun just to figure out how this goes. So we have this uh, story in, in JLNR. Now if you take uh, G transpose times G, then uh, G is closed under the transpose operation. So G tra transpose G, little g transpose little g is in big G. So the exponential of 2x is in big G. And so if you multiply by itself many times, it's also in big G. This is an infinite collection of elements in big G, and big G has only finitely many components, so two of these elements have to be in the same component. And if you multiply one by the inverse of the other, look at it this way if you like, some x of uh, 2nx times x of 2mx inverse, which is just x of some 2kx, that's in the connected component. Identity matrix. Now we can use what we just proved in the connected case. That means that X is in P. Indeed, TX is in P for all. So finally, if you look at this uh, fellow K, K is just equal to G times X minus x, so this now is in G. So if you start off with an arbitrary factorization, uh, and what you find is that the constituents of the factorization both lie inside of G. That's what this argument proves. So that's kind of cute and uh, fun. I'm not going to prove everything <laughs> in this level of detail. This was just uh, so we relax, go slowly. It's not a, it's a today it's a marathon. Marathon, not a, not a sprint. Okay. So wh what it means is that K sees the entire topology uh, of the group. What the group looks like, here it is. The group looks like just K times a vector space, at least as a topological space. And, and uh, this is very close to the fundamental reason why we insist on, on finitely many components. Inside of each component, there's an element of K number of components of K is equal to the number of components of G. Okay, that was uh, k kind of fun. And, um, oh, yeah, so let's go back to, to this uh, uh, theorem. Uh, 
So if we take this for granted uh, for a moment, then we uh, end up with uh, this conclusion here, which is that everything in G is uh, of the form K, something in K times something in A times something in K. Maybe I should uh, emphasize here that this is not, uh, this is not a, a unique factorization. It's certainly not a Cartesian product of groups. I'm just saying that the obvious uh, smooth map from K times A times K into G by multiplication is subjective. You can say more, but that's uh, what I'm saying right now. And what it means is that A is telling you the way to go off to infinity inside of the group. What the group G looks like is K, it contains K, and then uh, it goes off to infinity. G, if it's not compact, must have some A, and this A is telling you somehow what the group is look like at infinity, modulo some compact directions, some compactness, uh, G looks like A, it just looks like a vector space. So we hope that A somehow is responsible for part of the representation theory and that K is responsible for the rest and that more or less, uh, to a zeroth approximation, more or less what we want to show today. That's because uh, G is certainly K times the exponential of P, but everything in the exponential of P is conjugate and by some element of K, something in the exponential of P. All right, so uh, as for the theorem, this is so, uh, th this is, I I'm going to show you this argument because you can spend weeks worrying about why this is true or you can spend, uh, 30 seconds uh, being shown why it's true. Oh, so first of all, a little lemma which I forgot to state. Each time you have one of these A's, always uh, construct A by looking at all of the matrices in P which commute with a single element X. And if you think about it for a moment, you can just take uh, any X with a maximum number of uh, eigen, distinct eigenspaces, distinct eigenvalues if you like. Uh, inside of uh, the vector space A, there is the zero matrix, and the centralizer of the zero matrix in P is all of P. Everything in P commutes with the zero matrix. So that won't do the job. On the other hand, the zero matrix has only one eigenvalue, namely zero. If you happen to repeat that construction for a P, in, for an X inside of A, which has the most number of distinct eigenvalues, then it's easy to convince yourself that the only things which commute with uh, that element also commute with each other, so they constitute an abelian subspace as required. Now, if you have uh, two maximal abelian subspaces uh, built as the centralizers of two elements, x1 and uh, x2, so to speak. Uh, the, the trick is to choose a K which makes the following quantity as big as possible. Or as small as possible. I just need some extremum. And uh, what I've done here is uh, taken an inner product. And we'll just use the standard inner product on matrices, which is just the trace of transpose. Uh, Everything here is symmetric, so it's just the trace of the product in this particular case. 
But choose uh, k so that this, which you can certainly do because k is compact, so that this quantity, for example, is as large as possible. And so that means that these two vectors should be aligned up as well as possible, or maybe oppositely aligned as, as well as possible. And uh, so that it, it makes sense that that's what you want to do. You want these vectors to be as close to one another as possible. And uh, then we know by taking derivatives, oops, something else, why? That uh, because the, the infinitesimal version of conjugation is commutator, uh, the derivative is zero and the derivative is this, and this must be zero all the time. Think about it, that uh, tells you that the inner product of y and x1 is 2. 0, 0, 1. But the bracket of x1 and x2 lies in k. If you take the con commutator of two symmetric matrices, which are in the Lie algebra of G, then the commutator is in the Lie algebra of G, and now it's skew symmetric. So it exponentiates to something uh, which is an orthogonal matrix. That's pretty cool. So x1, x2. So the centralizer of x1 contains x2, and the centralizer of x2 contains x1. And so, so the, according to the way we chose x1 and x2, a1 and a2 have to be the same. Just for fun, I uh, thought I'd uh, show you those little things. Because uh, as I said, um, it's very important to, to understand uh, where we are using the hypotheses. Uh, that G is one of these groups, or is it here? Uh, and here we see some, just some basic tricks involving symmetric matrices and skewed symmetric matrices, which make the argument work. We will not do this every time because, uh, well, there's, there's not even, even though there are so many hours today for lectures, still there are not, not enough hours to give every argument in, in this detail. But just for some entertainment. Everyone is excited about the holiday next week. Excited? Holiday. Great. I think I will not travel to see my family next week. <laughs> okay. Before we uh, leave, uh, well, not, before we move on to parabolic induction, let me just uh, make a definition here. The dimension of A, which is now well defined because any two maximal abelian subspaces of P are conjugates, uh, that's called the uh, real rank. And if the real rank is zero, that means that this vector space P has only zero dimensional abelian subspaces. But every one dimensional <laughs> subspace is abelian. Every matrix commutes with itself, after all. So uh, there is no P. In other words, every matrix in the, in the Lie algebra of G is skew-symmetric, so the, the, the group is actually compact. This happens only if G is compact. And uh, for today, the philosophy today is that we understand compact groups, that we know everything about compact groups. And uh, this is um, a good place to start because um, many arguments or constructions are made, uh, I don't know, inductively or recursively. on this real rank. We want to find some mechanism to understand the representation theory of G, which maybe is a group of real rank 
I don't know, 12, in terms of various subgroups of G, which whose real ranks are smaller than 12. And uh, we'll agree that we understand, let's say for the sake of argument, the representation theory of all groups of real rank 11 or less, and then try and understand how groups of real rank 12 look on the basis of that. So we'll see that uh, coming up very soon. Ah, yes. A little bit more about uh, I made a, a little um, observation here that every maximal abelian subspace uh, of P is the centralizer of some particular element. And I said that a good way of choosing such an element was to, to choose any X for which the total number of distinct eigenvalues is as large as possible. And you can continue to try and understand A and uh, the geometry of this threefold product, where is it, this thing here, in terms of eigenspaces, but it's a little better to work with what are called roots rather than eigenvalues. And the reason is that uh, the, the concept of eigenvalue depends on how the group G is embedded inside of uh, GLNR, and it's possible to take a, a perfectly respectable group G and by accident embed it into GLNR in a very bad way. It's possible to choose a bad embedding, and when you choose a bad embedding, it becomes very confusing to work with eigenvalues. But there's, there's an intrinsic notion which is a lot cleaner and And it's just uh, the, the, the following thing. So what is uh, a root? First of all, these are, these are called uh, restricted roots. Maybe I should stick in that word. Roughly speaking, it means you look at the, the group as a group of uh, matrices and you, and you just pick out, you associate to each matrix one of its eigenvalues, but this does it in a more systematic way. First of all, we don't allow zero. It's not, not allowed as a root. And the second thing is that uh, there should be some x in the Lie algebra of G. This is a set of all matrices for whose, whose corresponding one parameter groups lie entirely inside of G, as you know. Uh, such that um, such that this formula holds. So there are, there are eigen space uh, eigenvalues for the adjoint action. So continuing this uh, discussion. In, in, inside of uh, A, there are various uh, maximal dimensional uh, subspaces, uh, dimension one subspaces, the so-called root hyperplanes. <coughs> 
draws the picture of SL3. <laughs> Let me do that. And um, <clears throat> for SL3, we, we want to find a maximal um, family of symmetric matrices commuting with one another inside of this phi. And, uh, well, we can just choose, what should we call these? diagonal matrices in this particular case, as you can almost always do. In order for such a matrix to exponentiate to something with determinant one, of course, it has to have a uh, trace uh, zero. And, uh, and then the picture, of course, uh, and so it's a two-dimensional space, not a, not a three-dimensional space. I have um, um, a medical problem, which is that whenever I draw this picture, uh, it's inevitably sort of rotated a little bit. It's not, I don't, I cannot draw this uh, A2 picture without it being at a little angle like that. Um, anyway, there it is. Uh, so what I'm drawing here is this, the, a picture of A, and inside of A, there are the matrices where, for example, A1 is equal to A2, and the matrices where A2 is equal to A3, and the matrices where A3 is equal to A1, and uh, they look like that. We could discuss this entire picture, it's obvious from the formula here that we could have discussed this in terms of, in this particular case, in terms of eigenvalues. After all, A1, A2, and A3 are the eigenvalues of uh, the matrix A1, A2, A3. And so this root business is, is nothing but, uh, you know, just some fancy, fancy word for, for eigenvalue, but it's a little bit easier to work in, in higher, in, for more complicated groups using roots rather than eigenvalues. Okay. Now you can study this situation carefully. And this is the sort of thing you do in a class in, in, in leaf theory. For each uh, root, root hyperplane, there is some element And it's not gotten in this way, it's gotten in, in a different way that you learn about in Lie theory. Or it's something you can check explicitly in any given example. What I'm about to say is totally trivial for SL3. And indeed, it's totally trivial for any particular concrete example uh, of, a, of a reductive group. And anyway, here's what I want to say. So the first thing I want to say is that conjugation with K sends A into itself. So in other words, K normalizes uh, A. And the second thing tells you exactly what this is. This is just reflection. Across. Everything in the root hyperplane is mapped identically to itself, and anything orthogonal to the root hyperplane is mapped to something opposite to itself, mapped to its negative. Okay, so this uh, is what you learn about in a course in Lie theory. The strategy for understanding this is to check that it's correct for SL2, which it is, SL2R, and then inside of any reductive group, build little copies, or inside of the Lie algebra, build little copies of SL2R, uh, and, and then you're in business. That's how it works in, in elementary Lie theory for compact groups. Okay. Now, any connected component of uh, the, the complement of the root hyperplanes is called a chamber, and it's a fact that if you look at the normalizer inside of K of A, this this collection of transformations that maps uh, A to itself. If you think about it, it must permute the root hyperplanes, and this thing now acts transitively on chambers, connected components. That's the sort of thing you prove in a leaf theory class. It's, uh, it's, it's trivial to prove it in any given example, uh, but uh, in leaf theory, the fashion is to consider all groups at once, and then then you have to develop some combinatorics of uh, 
file groups in order to see that this is true. Okay. Chamber is a component. A minus the union. So we can improve a little this uh, theorem here. Uh, by A plus, I mean just choose a chamber and then uh, take its closure. And uh, G is, uh, can be written in this way, G times K times A plus times K. If, if G is connected, this is the best you can do. If G is not connected, there are, uh, there are going to be elements of uh, this normalizer which fix a chamber globally, map a chamber to itself, and so you could do better. But this sort of improvement of the decomposition up there is as good as it gets in the case where G is connected. And this is why people like to study connected groups, because uh, for connected groups, uh, we have all of this uh, very beautiful combinatorics that you see in, in a Lee theory book available to us. Again, let's just draw the same picture that we just had over here. Here's the chamber. So now we, we have a slightly better picture of what uh, G looks like. G looks like a compact group times a set of directions for going to infinity times another compact group. Okay, and so in, in the case of SL3, there are, so to speak, two different ways uh, in which you can go to infinity or a third way which is sort of intermediate between the two extreme ways. Uh, and, and, and that's it. These two ways are not... Uh, not the same. There are different ways of going to infinity. The group looks different in those two directions. This picture for S3. Of course, for SL2, you're down one dimension. There's only one way of going off to infinity. And uh, what the space looks like is uh, just a space with one end going off to infinity. Very simple. And uh, now I want to uh, try to say what the group looks like as you march off to infinity in, in one of these directions. Let me just see. Yeah. I guess the, the way I drew this uh, I guess the way I set things up, the, the chamber was actually a, a subset of the, the Lie algebra, so we should exponentiate it uh, to get something inside of the group. Of course, the exponential map for these particular groups is a diffeomorphism, uh, in fact, a group isomorphism, so it's safe to identify A and big A Anyway, suppose you fix uh, an A in, in A plus. So now let's define uh, the following things. Uh, these are two subgroups of G. And they're defined in the following very attractive way. They're just the elements of G, which are the, um, well, we may have to make a choice, expanding or maybe contracting directions for, for the one parameter group associated to H. So what I want is this equation here to hold H. And while we're at it, let's define another group, which is just the centralizer. So I'll write it in a way that makes it look similar. 
Okay, they're, they're subgroups, closed uh, subgroups. Uh, let's just, just get an immediate understanding of what's going on. If you happen to be in a situation where H is, is a diagonal matrix like this, and for simplicity, let's assume this combinatorial order relation uh, among the uh, entries. For example, it could be minus 1, 0, and then 1 in the case of uh, SL3. Well, we, we know what happens when we conjugate, you can easily calculate, here it is, what happens when you conjugate by a diagonal matrix, namely the ijth entry gets multiplied by the ith entry of the, of the fellow doing the conjugation times the inverse of the jth entry. And so whether that individual ij entry goes off to infinity as uh, t goes to infinity, or it goes to zero as t goes to infinity, or it does something in between, depends entirely on the relationship between the sizes of the elements AI and AJ. So you can see immediately what this is. It's just all matrices in this particular case, all matrices of this type. And while we're at it, L in this particular case looks like Had we chosen uh, H so that uh, maybe the first two eigenvalues uh, were, uh, first two diagonal entries were equal to one another, then, uh, then uh, it would not be possible to force this entry to go to zero, and this would have to become a zero. On the other hand, uh, there would be many more entries, uh, in, in possible entries inside of L. But here's uh, one example. Okay, so it's very, very elementary, especially for a concrete group like uh, SLN. As soon as you've put the group into a form, so that uh, the A matrices are diagonal, then you see immediately that the N groups that we're building are just block unipotent matrices. They're block uh, upper triangular matrices with identities down the diagonal and zeros below the diagonal. And L is just block diagonal matrices. So very straightforward. If you happen to chose an H, where is it? Here, up here. Uh, so A plus was actually the closure of a chamber, but if H is in the chamber itself, in the interior that is, not in the closure, just in closure. That's the situation here where I chose a, a generic matrix. The, the walls of this chamber, as, as I indicated somewhere back there, consist of matrices where these two eigenvalues agree, or these two eigenvalues agree. Vertex section of the walls where all of the eigenvalues agree. Uh, but if you're in the generic situation where you're choosing a point inside, then uh, n is as large as possible and, and independent of h subject to this constraint. And L is as small as possible. And I could have said these um, two things uh, more precisely. Uh, the n and the l that you get in this particular case have the property that this n contains all other possible n's, and this l is contained in all other possible l's. So these aren't just minimal, they're minimums. They're contained in all of the other, or contain all of the other corresponding l's and n's. Uh, <clears throat> there's one other letter that we want to use. P, P stands for the semi-direct product of L with N, just the set of product matrices. So these are block uh, 
upper triangular matrices. Wait, when H is uh, interior, as I'm discussing up here, we get, it doesn't matter which in interior point we get, we get the same minimal parabolic. And this minimal fellow is contained in P for all. So it's, it's not just minimal, it's minimum. It's the intersection of all parabolics. You may wonder how the battle works out. Uh, the more special H, the matrix H is, the, the smaller N gets, but the bigger L gets. So when you take the product, you may ask, how does it work? And well, here's how it works. The, the, the um, product is minimal in, in the most generic situation. Okay. So we're looking at, in the case of the minimal parabolic, so to speak, all upper triangular matrices. And in the case of other parabolics, so to speak, for example, exactly for SL3R, various block upper triangular matrices. It's not very complicated. Uh, so once again, roots uh, are just eigenvalues, basically, and, and these parabolic subgroups are just upper, subgroups of upper triangular block upper triangular matrices, basically. But the convention, since Harris Chandra, is to uh, speak uh, in abstract terms, and, and that's what we're doing here. All right, so we're getting close to our uh, goals. Here. Any questions? Oh, you still, KitKat, for your very perceptive question. Any other perceptive, interesting questions? No questions? What else I'd like to say? Oh yeah, let me insert. Let me insert one uh, word here. You could make these constructions. You, you wouldn't have to fix the chamber first. Of course, you could make this construction for any H in the whole world. It still makes sense to to do these things uh, by by focusing our attention on uh, only part of A. Uh, and, and fixing an A, uh, so first of all, fixing an A among all of its possible conjugates and then fixing a chamber inside of A. We're, on, we're building only some of the possible parabolic subgroups that we might want to consider, and these actually have a name. These are called standard parabolic subgroups. And for our purposes, it will be enough to consider these standard fellows, so to speak, of block upper triangular matrices. All right. Oh, one more thing before we... Uh, we're, we're, we're almost at the end of this matrix theory, but one more thing. another one of these, uh, this, it was Howard decomposition, another one of these factorization results, but it's somehow a, um, well, a much better one for some purposes. Oh. This really, as, as um, manifolds, this really is a Cartesian uh, product. Like this. The obvious multiplication map from k times a times n into g. In the particular case where you're dealing with an n which corresponds to a minimal uh, parabolic, where n is as large as possible, this map here, this multiplication map, is a factor diffeomorphic. 
Burfrey matrix can be written as an orthogonal matrix times a positive diagonal matrix times an upper triangular matrix with ones down the diagonal. If you pick any parabolic at all, it's it's no longer possible to obtain such a nice uh, factorization. But here's a very useful uh, result, which is that the products of every element of the products of elements of K with elements of P exhaust all of G. There's some subjective map like this. Um, certainly not also uh, injective. Oh, by the way, among the possible parabolic subgroups, maybe I should make a little remark here. By the way. Strictly speaking, according to, the, according to the definitions, G is a parabolic subgroup of itself because you, I could have chosen H to be the zero matrix. And I ch had I chosen H to be the zero matrix, then uh, N would consist only of the identity matrix and L, on the other hand, would consist of all of G. So uh, sometimes uh, we want to exclude this possibility and consider only proper par parabolic subgroups. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's rather convenient to notice that G is a parabolic subgroup of itself. Okay. If you're doing induction arguments, it's not very helpful to have G among the subgroups which uh, um, of, G, of G itself. There's not, no possibility of simplifying from G to G, of course. Uh, but for other purposes, uh, this is Anyway, you see that when, when P is equal to G, obviously this map is not... All right, very good. Now, I have something here. What did I want to say? Oh, yeah, just uh, let's just. Um, from in particular, it may not be completely obvious, but it has to be the case that the dimension of G plus the dimension of A, which is the real rank, plus the dimension of N, in the minimal case, is equal to the dimension. And uh, I thought I would uh, just justify this decomposition a little bit by doing some, some little uh, calculations. And uh, for that purpose, uh, we'll introduce the following operation, which sends any matrix in the Lie algebra of G the minus of its transpose. The reason for putting in a minus sign is that this is now a Lie algebra automorphism. If you do it twice, the minuses cancel off, and the transpose of the transpose is the matrix you started with, so theta squared is one. So as, uh, just as a linear operator, theta has two eigenspaces, a plus one eigenspace and a minus one eigenspace. And the, the plus one eigenspace, because of the way we normalize things, plus one eigenspace is the Lie algebra of K, and the minus one eigenspace is P, what we were calling P before. So this packages uh, the, the whole thing uh, together. Suppose you, you start off with uh, something in N, then on the one hand, we could average, maybe we'll put in a half to make it proper average, uh, average using this involution. And when you do that, you get something which is fixed by the uh, involution, so it lies in K. On the other hand, you can anti-symmetrize. Corrective, right, that thing there. And, and now, of course, it's like... So this uh, shows how to take elements of uh, N and uh, decompose them, decompose them into parts coming from K and parts coming from P. And it's this uh, combinatorics, this very simple linear algebra, which is responsible for this um, identity among dimensions. I'll let you, let you think about that. Um, but I, I want to 
study a, rather than worry about this formula, just to study a generalization. This gets close to the close to the heart of, of, of the matter. Suppose I have an H like we had on that board over there, and it's parabolic subgroup like we had over there. Let's just do a little uh, linear algebra here. I want to take the leap the part of, of, of the Lie algebra of L, which is contained in K. So this is the Lie algebra of the maximal compact subgroup of K, of, of L, excuse me. And let me add to it N, the Lie algebra of N. What, when I add the two bits together, what I get is uh, effectively a copy of the Lie algebra of K, like this. This is uh, just a vector space isomorphism, what I'm about to write down. Not a Lie algebra isomorphism. So uh, what will we do? Well, you just take uh, any z here and you just average it, like we were doing uh, a moment ago. It doesn't matter what you what you Let's change one of these letters to something else, X over here, I guess. It doesn't matter what you start with, anything in the Lie algebra of G, of course, this becomes something in the Lie algebra of K. But in the particular case where you have this uh, subspace of the Lie algebra of G, this actually becomes an isomorphism. It's easy, easy to check. And it's a crucial fact, kind of a strange fact. That, I mean, this is not uh, a Lie algebra um, isomorphism, but it's also not far from one. And I, I want to try and uh, explain that. And for that purpose, let me think about the right way of working this thing. Oh, yeah, maybe. Maybe uh, as a warm up, let me explain how to go backwards, how to go backwards from skew symmetric matrices to these block upper triangular matrices. Come back to this in a moment. Here's uh, the the inverse map. So what uh, I will do is start off with any y and look at this what I'll call a zero component and its minus component. What I'm imagining doing here is taking the Lie algebra of, of K, or for that matter, the Lie algebra of G, and just decomposing it according to the action of Lie bracket by this matrix uh, H here. So I can look at the sum of the negative eigenspaces. plus the zero eigenspace, plus the sum of the positive eigenspaces. <coughs> and uh, what I'm doing is just removing anything which lies in a positive eigenspace. 
punchline. So what I want to, to do is uh, try to try to explain what uh, this means, this uh, sentence in the box, what it means. Okay. And for that, let me let me. Uh, I find it helpful to to well, maybe we'll deal with groups and the algebras at the same time. Let me define a, a new subgroup, KT. Well, uh, in a very simple way, I'm just going to conjugate by, which way around did I do it before? It's a subgroup, it's a compact subgroup, just a conjugate of the standard compact subgroup by K. But uh, now I want to add s something uh, at infinity. Uh, and for there, I'm going to just take uh, the following thing. I'm just going to take da, 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 k intersected with L. Okay. These are all compact groups. Uh, this is not a compact group, but uh, the notation is supposed to suggest that as t goes to infinity, these compact groups converge to this group uh, here. So these are um, all vector uh, subspace, in fact, least subalgebras of G, and all, they all have the same dimension. According to this calculation uh, over here. Now when you have a collection of subspaces, all of the, there's a sequence or a family of subspaces, all of the same dimension, it's, it's perfectly respectable to say that the family has a limit as, as t goes to infinity because each subspace just defines a point in some Grassmannian. And so you can ask inside of that Grassmannian, do you have convergence? And that's exactly what happens. do the same thing at minus infinity and n would get replaced by its opposite, the transpose. Okay. So in the uh, appropriate Grassmannian present. sort of see what's going on by looking at uh, uh, this uh, isomorphism. So if I have a matrix in the, in the Lie algebra of K, then if I conjugate it by minus th, I'll get something in the Lie algebra of T. And if um, I write x 
has a part which lies in the direct sum of the negative eigenspaces of uh, this conjugation operation, plus a part which lies in the zero eigenspaces, plus a part which lies in the positive eigenspaces uh, like this. And when I look at what happens in the, the minus eigenspace, I hope I have the signs correct. Over here, positive, yes. This goes to zero. So in the limits, so to speak, you get something which is in the Lie algebra of K infinity. Maybe this is all a little too fast. Let's just look at SL2. See uh, exactly what's uh, going on here. So, uh, of course, K is the set of all matrices, which are rotation matrices. For H, we could take our friend this matrix here, and then when we exponentiate it, what we'll get is x of t minus this. And when I conjugate, I get this. happens if we get the, everything works out correctly. I guess such a matrix, uh, this. So as, as t goes to infinity, this term just goes away. This term just goes away, and, and then the rest is upper triangular. Of course, this term is blowing up, so you have to think a little bit about what's going on, but that's basically the, uh, the calculation. So we defined a bunch of non-compact subgroups of G, the parabolic uh, subgroups of G. And inside of each parabolic subgroup, there is this uh, Ln. There is this subgroup which looks like L intersected with K times N. Here we go. And this is, this is almost a compact group. It's not a compact group, but it's a limit of compact group. So it behaves very like a compact group for certain purposes, enough like a compact group for certain purposes that we can um, make some interesting uh, reductions uh, from uh, using what we, what we know about compact groups. Any questions? I'm sort of entering a little bit of a, a, a lull here, just doing some experiments. Maybe it's time now to um, make, make, say something a little more uh, precise. I was trying to worry, I worried a lot last night, uh, and then I worried a lot this morning exactly how to explain these things, and I, I did not come to a good decision, so that's, uh, but let me now make a precise uh, theorem or two. The, the summary so far is we defined a bunch of interesting subgroups, and we discovered an interesting feature of these interesting subgroups, which is that uh, to a certain extent, they're approximately compact. They're limits of compact groups. And uh, they're related to the way G looks at infinity on the one hand, and, and secondly, they behave a little bit like compact groups on the other hand. And we have these strange uh, phenomena uh, at play, and now we want to do something with these phenomena. Maybe the right thing for me is to explain what the theorem is. First of all, a little lemma, which is not a difficult lemma, 
you, you can think of this lemma either in, in abstract terms as, as related to the concept of amenability, or you can think of it as a baby version of the theorem uh, that will follow. Oh, I need a little discussion. I'm sorry. Just a, I want to talk about L2 of G mod N, so I should talk about measures on G mod N. So fix a parabolic subgroup, fix an H, and then fix an N, as we were discussing before, and form this uh, homogeneous space. Of course, G acts on this homogeneous space on the left. It's a homogeneous space. There's an obvious transitive action of G. Uh, there's also an, an action of L on the right, because L normalizes N. You conjugate any element of N by an element of L, then you get another element of N. So there's an, a right action of L and a left action of G. As for the left action of G, there is a G invariant measure. We saw uh, this a little bit uh, in the case of SL2R. We looked at some example last time in the particular case where N is this fellow. We saw that G modulo N was the same thing as the plane, take away zero. Uh, and the action of G was just the usual matrix multiplication action. And, and that preserves the, the standard volume on L2, or the standard volume on, on the plane take away the origin because all of the matrix in G have determinant one. So this is consistent with what we've already said. That's the good news. The bad news is that this measure not uh, invariant under the right action of, of the subgroup L of, of block uh, diagonal matrices. Remember, in, in the particular case of this example, the right action of L just corresponded to scalar multiplication, and, and scalar multiplication doesn't preserve measure, of course. But It's, the situation is, is not too bad. Uh, see if we can it this way. But here's a, a formula. Suppose I have a function on G mod N and I have an element of L. Let me define a, a, a right action of F of L on F according to this formula. X is now a point in G mod N. I'll just define this to be f of x l. In fact, I want it to be a right action, so, so better to put an l inverse here. And now I'm just going to add in a, a little extra factor, and the correct factor is this. And now I have to just tell you what delta is. So delta is some radon nicotine derivative Just a homomorphism on this group L, the positive reals. I'll tell you what it is in just a moment. But first of all, the property is that this defines a right unitary action. Of L on this homogeneous space. I'm not sure we'll actually need the precise formula, but, but here's what it is. It's just the determinant, or the absolute value of the determinant of the map of conjugation by L from the Lie algebra band. Okay, now back to the lemma that I was about to, uh, about to state. Now that we got the measures sorted out, in this entire story, uh, this, this is a, a, a story in, in which the case of SL2 is extremely representative of what happens in general. So the way to understand these things is to, to think about SL2 uh, first. Okay, now the little lemma, which is the baby version of the theorem uh, that will follow. The lemma says that the action 
on this Hilbert space. This is a, you, should, you should think of this Hilbert space as a, in the first case, a simplified version of L2 of G. It's simplified because G modulo n has fewer dimensions than G. Uh, it's also simplified in the sense that whereas on L2 of G, there are two commuting actions of G, on L2 of G mod n, there's a left action of G, but a right action of the much simpler group L. So it's much easier to understand L2 of G mod n than it is to understand L2 of uh, G itself, because you can use anything you know about L to tell you something about L2 of G mod n, whereas uh, for L2 of G, all you can use is something about G to tell you something about G. That's not very helpful. But in the case of this space here, because there's a, a right action of an easy group, L, and a left action of G, you can attempt to use something about L to tell you something about G, and that's, that's the, the philosophy behind this. Anyway, the first uh, little point is that this extends to an action, a representation of this reduced T strategy. There's a correspondence between unitary representations of groups and, and representations of the so-called full Seaster algebra, but it's a little, there's a little bit of analysis involved in seeing that you actually get a representation of this so-called reduced Seaster algebra, that this representation is, in the language we were using, a tempered representation. It's no big deal, but there's just a little thing um, to, to check here. If you're a Seaster algebraist, you know that this, is, this sort of thing is always true whenever you divide by an amenable group. So this is certainly okay. N is a nilpotent group. Um, but we'll look at this in a different way in a moment. Because uh, what I want to do is uh, get to the big theorem here. At least state the big theorem. And uh, this theorem requires one adjustment if G is not connected, quite a complicated adjustment, and it requires a minor adjustment if G is not, does not have a compact center. So let's just assume for simplicity that G is connected and has compact center. Like SL2R, for example. SL2R is a perfect example uh, for, the, for this theorem. I want to build an ideal inside of the C-star algebra of G, which will be an intersection of other ideals, and there'll be one such ideal for each standard parabolic of the sort we were talking about. So I want to look at all possible types, if you like, of block upper triangular matrices, where the block sizes can change. 2, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2, whatever, 3, 1. Different, different types of block upper triangular matrices. And for each one, there's a representation of the C-star algebra. And that representation is the C-star algebra homomorphism, so it has a kernel. First of all, I'm going to call that representation lambda for left regular G mod n. I haven't finished statement yet. I ran out of room. Uh, there's a C-star algebra homomorphism. Its, its kernel, of course, is an ideal, and the intersection of ideals is an ideal. This thing here is some ideal inside of the reduced C-star algebra of G. Continue the statement. I want to say that uh, anything in this ideal is basically a compact operator, or to be more precise, it acts as compact operators on any Hilbert space of, of this type. I want to take L2 of G. But I want to cut down G on the right in a different way. Here I cut it down by N. Instead, I'm going to cut it down by K. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm just going to, I don't want to just divide by K. It's a little better to do the following thing. I'll take any finite dimensional representation of K and then look at the K fixed part of uh, this fellow here. So now what's going on is that sigma is a finite 
dimensional representation, unitary representation of K. And as, as to this action here, K acts on L2 of G on the right. If this representation was the trivial representation of K, this would be a fancy way of, of saying L2 of G mod K. This would just be L2 of G mod K. What this space is, is the L2 sections of some vector bundle over G mod K. That's what it is in general. So this is just a slightly fancier version of L2 functions on G mod K. And here's L2 of G mod N. Uh, that's it. That's now the <laughs> statement of the theorem. So l let me t t try to explain something about the uh, philosophy behind the theorem. Eventually, I'd like to explain something about why it's true, maybe in the, in the afternoon. I got confused thinking about this last night, so I, I don't have the optimal way of explaining this proof. But anyway, let's get back to the, the statement. What does this theorem say? It, it's trying to tell you something about the the spectrum, the dual of this C star algebra. And it's saying something very interesting. It achieves uh, what, uh, what people discovered about, for example, SL2R at the very beginning of this subject. It achieves this uh, breaking up of the representation theory into a continuous part and a discrete part, exactly as I was describing it to you at the very beginning of the lecture. So first of all, we use this t t terminology here. The, the representations, the irreducible representations of the reduced Seaster algebra correspond to certain irreducible representations of G. Not all of them, but certain of them. Is irreducible representations up to equivalence. Now, the thing on the right hand side is not just a set, it's a topological space. And the closed sets inside of this uh, topological space, this is for any C star algebra, correspond to ideals. Closed two-sided ideals in the C star algebra, say you know, I. If you have an ideal, you can build a closed set of, by definition, a closed set of representations, and it's just the set of equivalence classes of representations with the property that pi vanishes on J. On the other hand, if you have a, a collection of irreducible representations, you can build an ideal, and it's just the, the intersection of the kernels of the so this is the usual correspondence between uh, geometric sets on the one hand and ideals uh, on, on the other hand. 